<laughs> okay, sorry, you guys. Sorry it took so long. We were talking and we lost track of time. <laughs> we apologize, or I do anyway. Welcome we're not to. On yet. There we are. Yeah, we are. Says I am here anyway. Yeah, they're still saying Jeopardy. Whoop, I better turn this down over oh, here. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Welcome to the stream. Tonight we're going to talk about uh, food story no. again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how to rotate your food. Yes. Hope you're, everybody's having a good uh, Labor Day weekend. It's just about over, so everybody's going to have to go back to work, unfortunately. Well, that's it for us people that are retarded. <laughs> retired, I mean, excuse me. So, I wanted to start it off by saying that uh, food storage is one of the hardest parts of your prepping. is Because when you're going to store your food away, you need to think about storing it away in calorie needs instead of by serving size and by wh what I mean by that is it's based on the calorie intake of each person in your house I mean it's easy to set cans and food up on your shelf or wherever you store them at and say I have I'm pre preparing or prepping my uh, stuff but are you going to have the right uh, calorie intake for uh, what you're going to need every day. You, you actually prep by your calorie needs and not by the serving size. Oh, and also don't forget the uh, fats. We also need lots of fats and proteins and everything else, Will. Yeah. We're going to be working so hard. Yeah, that's why it's <laughs> important to look at the calorie intake instead of the portions. Well, portions are all messed up. Easiest way to do that, I don't know, uh, I, I, I haven't harped on this for a while, but if it's possible, you need to try to get uh, yourself into a group or form a group too, because that'll help with the cost of being able to uh, put your, your preps away. I mean, every person can have their own, but form a group so that in the bit of the uh, <laughs> Oh, the cat wants to come and play. Apparently, he decided yeah. he had to get the attention right now. Yep. So in case uh, something did ba happen badly, you know, like the hurricane out there on Florida side or uh, earthquake out there on California side where Steve lives, yeah, that you have a group of people to, fall, to pull together and uh, make sure everybody has a survival rate. Did Lori Jean ever come back? <laughs> uh, anybody that's, uh, why don't you start now, now uh, read. Let me breathe for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that is, I think, really, really good is to start learning how to prepare foods in the traditional way. It's not like many of us can afford to buy, you know, a four or $5,000 freeze dryer and have the high tech option to freeze dry all of our own food all the time. Uh, we're going to be looking back to the old colonial days and other stuff. So now a lot of times it's going to be, you know, smoke curing, salt curing, uh, drying and dehydrating things. And then, of course, canning methodologies, which is very accessible for all of us. And then, of course, for a lot of foods, they can just be dry stored, like beans, corn, other stuff like that. All you need is a dry storage, and then they can happily, you know, work out because they're a hard seed. And you just have to, you know, get them prepared for what you're going to make. Like if you're going to make your beans, yeah, get them boiling for that day. And then you can make your refried beans or your bean stew and other stuff like that. So well, I think when we think a lot of food storage and stuff, we're really going to have to look back to some older technology of the 1800s to see what was very accessible back then. Because that's a lot of what we're going to be working with. When the grid's down, I mean, we can still salt things. We can still smoke things. We can still dry things out on the sun. And, of course, canning can be done off-grid. Uh, just has to be careful and keeping the fire at the right temperature and such. And of course, for a canning expert, Anthony's here. Anthony, tell us how to can. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> You're all hey, on, Anthony. Today. How y'all doing today? You doing good? Yeah, we're doing good. Apparently, everybody's in a good mood. How about you? I'm doing great. Uh, I right. just went by the grocery store and saw everybody freaking out for whatever reason because the hurricane. So I'm down. <laughs> The uh, to, to jump on what he was talking about with canning, thanks, Reed. I appreciate that. 
the uh, the main reason why you need to learn how to do it, I think, in my opinion, is because electricity may not always be there. So it's nice to know that you have an option uh, and not to mention the fact that you can pre-make your meals. So I know a lot of people that aren't even worried about electricity going out. They're just like the fact that they might be working two to three jobs and know they can make a meal in a jar and can it, put it away in the pantry and open it up and eat it within five minutes. So hey, that'd be neat, Anthony. You should definitely do some videos directly on that topic. I'd love it. Absolutely, because there's a uh, there's a good recipe for a beef stew um, that one of my friends taught me because she was pregnant and she wanted to make all her meals beforehand. That way, whenever oh, she had the had her child, she was good to go and didn't have to worry about anything. So she had like 12 weeks worth of food uh, pre-made, basically, because her husband couldn't cook very well, and uh, she wanted <laughs> to at least. <laughs> She wanted to at least have some good food, so she made a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, uh, that alone made me really kind of focus on canning because it's, you know, it's a, it's a good option for every, even everyday use. You don't have to be worried about being a prepper to do it. Uh, mm -hmm. So just kind of one of those things where uh, the option having it there is great. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love dehydrating. If you were on uh, Steve's live stream earlier, his apples looked like mushrooms. They were great. Um, so dehydration is is awesome especially for fruits and things that'll hold up for it uh, but just having the option is just fantastic yeah. and i can't see That's the chat good. so if anyone's trying to talk to me with the chat i'm sorry i can see the chat yeah well the uh actually also though um why don't you talk about the financial investment to get started just with water bath canning anthony isn't that pretty oh. minimal no problem yeah you can usually get your water bath canner i think it was at walmart uh about two weeks ago and I walked by the canning sections to see if they had any kind of deals because I always walk by looking for extra jars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you get a water bath canner for like under $40. And you can get the small 16-quart pressure canner for like $68. So I know that breaks the bank with some people, but it's so reasonable. Uh, if you can at least save up maybe a few weeks, you know, uh, do some side work, sell something. Uh, that way you can afford to get a simple water bath canner. You can make salsa, anything that's got acidity in it which is your fruits, stuff that you can pickle with vinegar and uh, tomatoes, peppers, that kind of thing, you can do in a water bath canner. So you can easily start stashing away uh, extra, extra produce or the fruit because this is right now is the season for pears, apples, cherries, all that good stuff. So you can start preserving that for the wintertime. So we got a nice little treat. Now, one, I actually picked up a lot of uh, canning jars and supplies at an estate sale one time. I got a really good deal. You know, some people, the younger group didn't want any of it from what their grandparents used to do or whoever. And they were like, ah, let's get let's get rid of all the cans and everything. So 10 bucks for all this. Sure. Great. I'll do that. So I often say, watch the, uh, you know, the ads for estate sales and like that. It's amazing how much canning supplies that people are like, oh, we don't want this. And they'll just say, get rid of it. And you can find a nice, good gold mine that way. Yeah, you know, that that's the way because they don't know what they have. They might just almost give it away. They might just have a box, and you say, "What do you want for that?" And they'll say, "Get it out of here." You know, you might just. It's true. Score. It's true. Yep, I've seen it happen. I've seen it Goodwill. They're they're there for like four dollars for an entire water bath canner, and I've actually picked one up as an extra, as a my spare, just because it was so cheap. What do you got, Alana? I don't know how to can food. No, tell us about uh, your uh, I know how to tell everything. Jam. Tell us your expertise for a second. <laughs> My expertise is not canning. <laughs> My expertise is just, I guess I don't have an expertise. I just, how do you, you know, like, I want to talk you, about the story. How do you store? Uh, how do you store? Thing. Tell us about your storage. I organize my storage by date like you were saying i i do that i because otherwise things are gonna get old things are gonna get all mixed up and i'm a very disorganized person <laughs> but i i do i have like a pantry with a whole bunch of different shelves in it and like every shelf i put like the newer stuff on a certain place the older stuff on a certain place and i label it i label it with white duct tape <laughs> and i just write dates on it and that seems to work. That's a great way, Alana. That's really good. Because I don't want to um, look at I have the to admit, when I first. Can. You know, oh, like, look, I don't they, they put like them in the weirdest places all the time. I, I have the heck of a time. And actually, 
um, logistics for date rotation and all that is something that can really bite you. When I first got started, I wasn't paying close attention to it, and I had a lot of food go bad um, and didn't even realize it. And uh, it was like a total big oops. I tell you, getting organized is so important. So so if it shit hits the fan, you know, uh, Alana's in charge of organizing our stuff. Well, I just put like a big date on it. So I don't have to like, because you know, if they're piled on top of each other, you're not going to want to take them all down and look at all the little tiny. So I just stick like a big date on the front. <laughs> See, I, I kind of, I like, I, I was playing with something like that, like put boxes and then that so that and then i'd have shells with dates on them of like you know quarters mm -hmm. of a year and so i'd right. move them from moved move the box to each section as they kind of rotate in and out and so it always that whatever was in that box i would make certain get used up before the time expired on a lot of it i mean well, I put, um, yeah. things like tomato sauce in their own place yeah another, stuff another good idea is to put well. the date on the uh, whatever you're storing and then like on the shelf on the front of the shelf put at the date that you should rotate it yeah and that way you're it's always just looking you at the face when you're going in there and putting stuff in and writing stuff down you can just look and say oh i gotta rotate that one pull that one down write it down what you have to replace sure because there's some stuff that isn't that's what i do that's how i do it anyway everybody has their own way of doing it but uh, as long as you're learning how to rotate it that's the big thing because people forget. They think they have they put it up there. They don't have to rotate it in and out. That's Ooh. not really the really the way to do it. Yeah, well, I used to think that until I had a bunch of tomato sauce explode on me. Oh, I, I had a a bunch of canned cherries do that to me. They ate <laughs> through the can. Eats through the can after. Yeah, I know. They right through the can and just leaked everywhere oh, mm -hmm. i had the hugest mess to clean up and i'm i was like first looking in the pantry going where what is all this stuff where is it coming from and i eventually found the can that just went <laughs> just got through it so you should put, probably put like tomatoes and cherries and things in like a glass jar and then like just don't let the food hit the upper part mm -hmm. but it's yeah see that if you, yeah if you get them at the store and they're in metal they're not gonna last like the other stuff yeah, that's the true problem with the metal cans is they, they're not good for acidic stuff. And also, you think about it as like, how do you reuse a metal can in a lot of ways? There's a big issue with that. you got to have specialized tools to reseal the tops and all this other stuff. Uh, I'm not really a big fan of the metal cans either. Um, yeah. I like to convert them to like candles and stuff. If you know how to make candles from like extra wax, just melt them in cans. works great. But yeah, you can't reuse metal cans unless you got specialized equipment. Yeah, and the the glass jars I think are great because, like you said, like Alana mentioned, is the acid's not going to eat through the glass. You know, mm -hmm. your canned yeah. tomatoes and all that stuff they're going to store real well. And yeah. I have a lot Even of bad, you can at least see if they're going bad too because yeah. you can see the color go, and uh, you don't have to worry about walking by your pantry wondering what, what that weird sour fermenting smell is <laughs> when you realize you're, right. you're <laughs> busted through the can and drip down your entire wall. Well, it's Reed's cherries blowing up. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, you guys. Oh, hold on a second. I'm gonna. One of you guys are gonna pop out just for a minute. You're just gonna go out in the waiting room. I have no another person that wants to come in, and I'm gonna ask her how she does it too. Next week, I won't have this problem. I'm gonna just go ahead and pay for the subscription so I can have all of you guys in here at the same time. But that's how I have to do it for now because I'm on the free version. Right. But don't go anywhere because I'm not done with you. No problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hi. Hi. This is Lori Jean. I want Lori Jean to tell us how she does her food storage and rotation. Okay. Well, from my grandma, I learned that when I do canning in the jars, not in the cans, um, I don't use the lids itself like if i run out of tops i use paraffin wax and it keeps them fresh as oh, well wow, looks like nobody got popped out cool no everybody's still here <laughs> that works for me go ahead sorry did anybody hear me yeah we all no, hear we're good go ahead. Oh, okay. i wasn't sure so yeah, that's what I do with my canned goods. And I don't have a can of Bruce, but I've been using my Instapot and my uh, slow cooker to can my goods, um, not meat or anything. 
And then as for vegetables, I'll keep my little do not eats that you get in different things. And uh, I will put them with all my grains in the old jars that I no longer use. And I make sure always, always eat the stuff that you brought in last. I know that we're all talking about the, the canning end of it, but has anybody thought about the dehydrating end of it? Or you could dehydrate the fruits and stuff like that. It's so expensive, though. I haven't well, done you any do dehydrating yet except just sun drying myself. Well, you, you can, you can do Hopefully not that bad. In an oven, but it's it's kind of like a process. They, it works you well if you're it. in the wintertime. Uh, you can leave your oven cracked. Whatever the lowest temperature setting is, if it's not a gas oven, just leave it the, the gas or leave the electric oven kind of cracked. Put like a wooden spoon in there. And on the lowest setting, it should be like 185, 200. You can dry that way and kind of use the bonus of having, a, um, you know, heating your house also. That's why you only want to do it in wintertime. But you can make jerky that way. It takes like six to eight hours, depending on how you cut it. But you can totally dehydrate that way. Or like Reed said, take advantage of the sun when it's hot outside. Yeah, uh, if you if you dehydrate it, here's my thing is if you dehydrate it, even fruit and stuff, after you get it dehydrated, you can put it in the jars and then mm -hmm. can it so that it stays long, uh, fresher longer. Oh, you mean actually go through the water bath processing? Yep. I don't think that'll work. You don't have the headspace. Well, you wouldn't have to put the water in there. You could just put them in, into the jars and then take, uh, shoot, how did I do that before? Is you take this a hose comes with your little... Uh, it's yeah. a meal thing, and you just put the little adapter on top of the jar, and it seal takes all the air out and seals the lid on it right. And then all you uh, have to do is just turn the actual ring lid on. Well, and I don't know if you just got a anything. video up about dry canning. Might be related. I haven't yeah, I haven't messed with it at all though. That's how I used to how I do all of mine when I did the dehydrator. I used to have yep. banana chips and apricots and, mm -hmm. and just you name it. You know, I even do it to oh. my jerky, even do it to my jerky. You know, Kenton and that way you didn't have to freeze it. It says it's called the seal of adapter. Is yeah, that right. it's like a lid that goes on top of it. It has a little hose that comes out the top of it. Okay. It goes right into your like little seal meal thing. And he says it's not. There's not a water bath. It's just using this adapter to seal it. Yeah, yeah taking the air out, replacing, taking the air out, so that it will uh, store longer. If, yeah, if you, you have, have the food savers, computer, you can do that. Sorry, Anthony. If you have a vacuum cleaner, you're not the same thing. Oh, I got it. I got one, Anthony. That's yeah, I've got a vacuum cleaner as well, and I, I, I bought my food saver. You. See, I don't want to dry fruit. I want to freeze dry fruit, which is different. Yeah, yeah I would love to yeah. do that too. They're just, you know, darn those things are expensive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you guys know rural readiness, but she has one of those huge uh, freeze dryer. I think it's a freeze dryer. Let me see. Somebody out there in the let me see. I know somebody out there in the chat knows it I think it's chipper. Is chipper still out there? Is it what does uh rural readiness is that a Regular dehydrator, or is it a freeze-dried dehydrator? Somebody out there in the side chat knows her own readiness, I know. And she spent, like, I can't remember, $5,000 on this machine. Uh, it says it's oh, a harvest dry freeze-dryer. Yeah. Freeze-dryer, then, because it's that expensive. Yeah. So I've actually decided... Less than that. I've actually decided as I've been researching this, I'm going to attempt to build one with my refrigeration projects. See if I can mm. make one actually work for you, Anthony, oh, since you were no. asking about it too. <laughs> I love freeze dry stuff. I, I wanted to mention really last summer I tried something um, because I don't have a dehydrator and I wanted one, but I don't want to pay 600 bucks for it. I have a great big box fan. I put it upside down. I put a filter on it and I put my fruit on there. It took about 36 hours, but it did dry out. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, they call that the hillbilly method. Exactly. I, yeah, I've done that before, before I had my first dehydrator. That's how I did it, was with a fan. And it works too, but it just takes a lot longer. It, well, it does. And you don't have to heat up the house with the oven. Yeah. 
Well, depending on what you're drying, you don't have to worry about using a dehydrator either. If you're doing vegetables or something, you can just hang them upside down, like in your kitchen or wherever. Huh. That would be something to see. Hey, let me get to the kitchen here. here. I, I hang up parsley upside down all over my house. My wife it drives her nuts, but I'll put parsley. <laughs> um, she's like, what's going on here? Are we having some sort of ghost problem? No, no, I'm just hanging parsley. <laughs> Are you sure it's parsley? <laughs> I, I've done that with my onions and my garlic when I take them out of the garden. I will hang them up all downstairs on my clotheslines mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks and they'll dry out and they'll be good to go. Garlic. You gotta cure them. And then you look like you're afraid of vampires, but you're really just curing garlic. <laughs> yeah, I have a. I like. I store my garlic and onions in paper bags and hang them up in the closets and stuff and things. I've got one closet dedicated to storing things dry you know the it's sort of my thing of a root cellar but i need to build a real root cellar eventually but right now i just stole a closet <laughs> i just need a house and i could do that <laughs> I mean, the product. I mean, so. there's a house right you. next to me Anna, that's they're trying to sell for thirty thousand dollars that's cheap. And it's pretty cheap <laughs> where is it <laughs> yeah for a house that's cheap and how new mexico for a house for <laughs> land Um, I'm in the process right now of building a cold room downstairs. I was just going to ask, has anybody else, because I store, once my onions have dried, I store them in stockings. Has anybody else does that so that they don't rot? No. Oh. Nope. Yeah. New one to me. Hey, New one to me. I mean, I've never, I've never done you, Never put, have a you put your onion in, make a knot, and then you put the other onion in, make a knot, and when you want the onion, you just cut the hosing off, and you're good oh. to go. They well, that makes, garlic, that, that sounds garlic. like a pretty good idea, actually. Yeah, it keeps the air flowing. like that where I am, with little garlic, and then it's tied, and then another garlic, and it's tied. They sell it at the store like that. And see, Anthony, now you have a new way to confuse your wife. She'll be asking why you're grabbing all her pantyhose. <laughs> I'll just confuse the store clerk at the drugstore. <laughs> hey, can I, where's your pantyhose? Uh, I need to go do some onions this way. What? <laughs> Actually, you know, you're not a real prepper until you've checked out at the store and people are looking at what you got and going, what are you doing? <laughs> I've, ha I've had the girls at the store ask why I'm buying so much rice. They're like, how, how long does it take you to go all through all this rice? Oh, well. I've had well, that question about the beans. That was strange because I live in the Asian part of my area yeah. and like everybody in the store is buying like 30 pound bags of rice. Well, if you fill up a six gallon a bucket <laughs> of with beans, that. that's about 432 servings if you do that. So, you know, you go to the store, you get those bags, those big bags of beans. Mm -hmm. You can't oh, keep yeah. them in that plastic bag. You got to break it up. So you get a six-gallon bucket, yeah. you start filling them up. And every time you fill a bucket up, you put one of those watertight tops on there with an uh, absorber inside of it. Then you've got 432 servings. Figure that out. You, know? you have to make uh, oxygen absorbers yourself with silica. The... Actually, if you guys are curious, I actually have a video on my channel um, that shows how to vacuum seal a five-gallon bucket of food using a little, like, vacuum sealer. It's pretty interesting. So I actually vacuum pack my food in my five-gallon buckets with an oxygen absorber, and so they're really well protected in mylar <laughs> and stuff. But so like, uh, you take the mylar and you uh, actually vacuum seal that, right? Yep, uh, and it's all throw, vacuum then packed. Then you throw it in the bucket, and then you vacuum. Well, it, no, the bucket. mylar goes in the bucket first. You fill everything up, and then what I do is I cut the bag in a. I cut triangles off the side of the bag, and I heat seal those sides. And so then I've got a little top at the top that fits in the vacuum sealer, and I can suck the whole bag and pull it all out. Oh, and then wow. I just pack it up That's and seal it down. Amazing. Yeah, you think right. outside the box, huh? I, I, I always think my outside vacuum the box. Sealer, my vacuum sealer as well. I'll get my beans and my rice and my noodles and stuff, and I'll put it in a bucket. And if I don't have a Mylar bag that I've bought somewhere, usually when you get, like, your potato chips and stuff, they come in a Mylar bag. Keep those, wash them out, use them. Put in oh, your good idea, Lori. absorber, 
And if you don't have, um, like if the bag is too big to put in your vacuum seal bag, you can use a flat iron to actually melt the bag closed. Yeah, I do a little creative cutting to make it fit on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting though, it's like around here, since I'm sort of an agricultural community, uh, like they grow a lot of beans in the state. Green chili, of course, mm -hmm. is everywhere. They also grow peanuts in a town. Next. So when a lot of the food farm stuff comes in, it's nice. You can get, you know, 50 pound bags of stuff for like 20 bucks. Real handy. Yeah. yeah. That's how corn is around here. Corn and soybeans. Yeah, everywhere. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not as lucky on corn and, and wheat out here for that. Yep. We get corn, corn, peaches, a lot of stuff around here is just, they, they almost want to throw it away. So if you know a farmer and you can just go ask them, hey, you know, when they go through their peach fields, especially, uh, usually they go through pick everything that's ripe at that time and whatever's not ripe they just let fall on the ground so all you do is just know somebody and be like hey can i run through after you're done picking it and whatever you don't get get sure so that's what they do so same with peanuts when they run through with the peanut machine you just talk to somebody just like learn your your neighbors and uh, once they go through the machine you can pick up peanuts like buckets full of peanuts for free just go out there and pick them up oh Weird. i didn't even know they grew them there mm -hmm. peanuts I know uh, pecans. They have pecans down uh, southern New Mexico. There, they have big groves yeah, of them down there, and they yeah, have they've, uh, they've they have got, machines that just take it and, and grab the bottom of the tree and shake it, sure. and uh, then it has it's a tape on really the top of the machine that catches them as they fall out, and then they let uh, people walk in the in there after they're done with it and pick the ones that don't hit the the catcher, they let them, let them pick up the one drop the ground. So I imagine any farmer that does that would, wouldn't mind somebody going in and cleaning his uh, ground up after him going through and harvesting. You're helping. You're, you're helping them in the long run. That's why if you're just like nice, you know, and just really personable with people, all you got to do is just, you know, meet the right person and just be really nice and just be like, hey, I'll offer to do this. Just let me keep whatever I pick off the ground. They'll be more than Usually they're more than happy to let you run through Yep, because it, it's not really labor, what is it, uh, cost effective for them to pay the labor to get the stuff missed. Exactly. And and tons and tons of, of waste times, happens that way in our farms these days. Well, a lot of times the uh, the fruits, especially a lot of fruit farms, a lot of the pests overwinter in the, the decaying fruit. So oh, it, helps, uh -huh. it helps them if you can offer to pick up the decaying fruit or at least you know get rid of some of it so it's less of a pest problem the next year. So they're not worried about spraying so much. And all you got to do is just offer and be like, hey, look, I'll pick up whatever so you don't have to worry about bugs for next year. And they'll be like, oh, please do. Only, you know, I'm going to want to pay you to do it because it's just. Yeah, I was just looking at the side chat there, and Great Man says you can get a home size freeze dryer for about two grand. Oh, they went down? I just, I just want a small, tiny one for an apartment. See if I can find it here on this one there. Like one bag of fruit size, Alana? Well, yeah, because I don't have a lot of room, but, you know, yeah, there I can just use it over and over and over. <laughs> I don't pay electricity <laughs> here, so while I'm That's here, I would say they said you get a small, <laughs> small home freezer, dr freezer dryer for about two grand. So if it's not that much where you are, maybe you could uh, network with Gray Man. He could get you a deal on one. <laughs> That's a lot Read with a bottle of Jack Daniels. No, it's iced me, tea. That's a lot of money. <laughs> it's iced tea. I mean, I, I, I'm late on getting any food in me this year. So, I, I mean, this today. So, I was real starving, actually. This year. Yeah, I know this year. Actually, before the live stream, I was showing here's some of the popcorn we harvest today off of the plants. Nice. Ooh, it's purple corn. You're going to grind it? You're gonna it like that. Uh, pop and grind and a bunch of other stuff. And then here's another one of it, the same one. So, it's got different colors. That's nice. And things. I love purple corn. They don't have a lot of it around here. Uh, well, I'm going to grow a bunch of blue corn next year. Uh, I need. I got seeds blue from the Hopi tribe, and I need to actually get start working on getting it, getting used to how to grow it. And I'm going to change up what beans I got with my corn plants because this year, unfortunately, I didn't spend as much time in the garden because I've had this work project been hanging over me the whole year from that's been consuming time like crazy. And usually with the beans I plant, you have to go in and actively make certain they're not, you know, 
taking over your corn stalks, going right up it. And uh, I did. I was short on time, so a lot of the corn just looked like, help me, help me. They're covered in beans. Yeah. So, was it being pulled down? Was it I've pulling the corn down? Pulled down, down. But the bigger yeah. problem was is the beans covered the silks so much, some of the corn didn't get pollinated. So uh, no. um, I'm going to swatch out uh, a different type of bean with the corn next year with a black bean that won't climb on them like that. Um, and the beans that mm -hmm. grow so well here, I'm going to put on trellises and match up with some other stuff just, mm -hmm. just in case I'm short of time again. Well, for for a fun fact, if you ever run into uh, – if you want to do the Three Sisters garden method and – That's what I use, think, yeah. Um, and Because I, I use blue corn, Hopi blue corn, uh, as mine because it's really tall corn. It's really sturdy. But I also use rattlesnake pole beans as my, my beans, and they did exactly that. They climbed and they pulled down my corn. So uh, I had to go through there and actually cut the beans before the corn was almost ready because it was actually pulling the corn down. Um, yeah. It is so amazing how corn to climb on, right? Oh yeah, yeah but it's <laughs> almost too good, so you have to cut back. So, and uh, I'm trying to find that same bean that can that can climb like a runner bean, but not mm -hmm. actually pull down my my stuff. So that's just if you're all looking on, you know, rare seeds or whatever, don't get the rattlesnake pull beans if you're gonna do a three sisters. The one, cause the one thing that's gonna pair really well is gonna be my black beans, cause they will actually climb up a bit, but they're not nearly as aggressive. So I think they're going to be a really good fit. Which one did you say, the black bean? Yeah, a type of black bean um, and stuff. You know, <laughs> I'll get your address later, and I can send you some stuff to try in your area if you want to see how some of my oddball seeds grow in your area, Anthony. Sure. I mean, we're in almost the same climate, except I got a bunch more humidity. <laughs> That's the big difference. My stuff's made for an arid climate, so it'd be interesting. Well, it, might, it might grow, too, though, because the humidity might give it moisture count. Well, the moisture might help, but I think a lot of my stuff isn't going to be ready to deal with the mold. So, so yeah. that's the differences we're going to have. Like, uh, I'd be interested in trying some of his seeds in my area to see how they turn uh, adjust to such a dry climate and things. Yeah, uh, uh, the, a lot of problems with some of the stuff you get is like the squashes. They'll develop a lot of powdery mildew. That's why you got to make sure you're really like paying attention to when you water. Only in the morning. Do not water at night. Another thing you guys might want to think about uh, putting in bulk on your uh, storage list would be, uh, shoot, what is it? It's called rolled oats because they they're good for antioxidants and stuff. So in a SA, good situation, you might need it, you know. And they can they last a long time if you put them into a bucket, you know, like uh, uh, Camp Patton said, you know. If you use the buckets with the tops that screw on, you can actually uh, use the seal mealer to get the air out of the can. So that might be something to just put in into your list of stuff that you have on the on your uh, shelf. No, I have rolled for a long for a long term uh, long term storage. Just not the piece I was eating. Still, even with long-term storage, you still have to write on there when you put it up, you know. Those oh, yeah. Make sure you those still have to be rotated. I need to do a bunch of videos on the logistics of food rotation because uh, that was something as I, as I got past like one or two months of food, I found out that the logistics of managing a large food supply, uh, it's daunting. It is amazing how complicated that gets um, because – if you're not paying real good attention to it, you suddenly realize, oh, my gosh, we totally missed this. It's now bad. Mm -hmm. um, and, like, I'm – actually, does anyone have a good way of being able to make freezer-burned meat taste decent and edible? <laughs> lemon juice. Lemon juice. I, <laughs> Let, I, lemon juice. I, had all I cook it and give it to my cat. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've messed that up before. We've got uh, a fair amount of freezer-burned uh, – meat that we missed in the freezer that that was in the back and we just didn't for some reason pull it forward and what it's like, kind of meat is it um it, it well it got beef um now it's funny though is my fish i have had like salmon in the freezer like way mm -hmm. past and it's fine my yeah. fish is usually really good but other meats they don't they don't do well beef especially 
No, and thanks. it doesn't have as much fat. How about Gray Man? What do you think, Gray Man? He's out there in the side chat. What do you think about? Can he uh, save some of that freeze dried meat by doing something to it? He's pretty good. He, he uh, knows freezer burned. <laughs> You know, not freeze dry, freezer burn. Oh, freezer burn. Yeah, sorry about that. So he might be able to come up with something to help you out there. I, I asked maybe we'll get him to say something there in the side chat. Well, treat it like uh, you would gamey that. meat. Well, what'd you say, Anthony? Sorry. I said treat it like you would if it was like an extra gamey meat. Like maybe you have to soak it. Maybe you might, on the flip liquid. side, I'm, my oh, diet's turning a bit more. Uh, we're trying to turn a bit more vegetarian because mm -hmm. when you're planting a lot of this stuff out and growing all that stuff, you really need to be adjusted to what your dietary plan is for SHTF. Yep. And mm -hmm. being veg uh, you know, vegetarian heavy is obviously more accurate to what our what we're going to be eating because we're going to be growing things yeah. and stuff. Great man says throw it out. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, just throw it out. And stuff. And so, like, well, things that are very accessible for doing that is, like, obviously vegetarian stuff, but also then you can, you know, hydroponics, raise fish, and all sorts of other things like that. Um, yes. And things I think are going to be a really good win for uh, prepping and long term sustainability. I also think, you know, raising certain other uh, meats um, and animals like um, rabbits and stuff can be helpful. Because honestly, if you look at the planning and the whole things for me, it comes down to becoming a, you know, real farm. So you're going to have your, your cats, your dogs, all sorts of working animals helping out with an area. And like cats are <laughs> super, super important to keep protecting your garden from rabbits, keeping birds away, keeping the darn mice away, all sorts mm -hmm. of things like that. I mean, everyone talks about dogs, how important they are. And that's a given of how helpful they are. But the cats are also extremely, extremely important partners for humans of protecting oh, our keep grains. The road, keeping the rodents away, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, another thing is when you keep Somebody a lot of rodents and stuff away, marinade and slow cook it. you keep uh, one of the other things that helps is when you keep a lot of rodents away, it keeps the snakes away. And the last yeah. thing, I was researching about venomous snakes. Uh, there is not a good off-grid <laughs> method to treat a snake bite. There really isn't. I have been digging into this, and uh, there is not something helpful on that. Here I have you just go, Reed. here you go, Reed. Cap Fatten says there's a lot freeze of freeze burn things. food can be saved. Soak it in citrus marinade and slow cook it or crock pot it. No, oh, I will have to give that a try. Thanks, Cap Fatten. Uncle Al says grind it and put some MSG and wine and lard in it. Huh? Interesting. Might well, be able to make some new things to try. Might be able to make pemmican out of it. I just treat it like I would a gamey meat and soak it in, in some sort of uh, hardcore acid, like a lemon juice or a mm. apple cider vinegar. I'm sure that would take away a lot of that taste. Yeah, Hoopo said smoke it. I don't think that yes. would work. That's not legal in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> Amputation for snake bite. <laughs> well, honestly, uh, unfortunately, I, for depending on what kind of toxin you're dealing with, that might be the only option. I was think recently looking at because they can't go deep into the skin to get into the arteries right away. It's like if you have access to cold, like a uh, ice bath or something like that, you could cool the limb greatly to shut off all the capillaries on the outside of it. Um, and if there's some way you could excise and cut out the affected area, you could greatly lessen the amount of venom still in the body. Mm -hmm. But you're digging into some ugly, ugly options. I mean, depending like neurotoxins, that's that's a really bad problem. Uh, most of the stuff in North America, <laughs> yeah, most like of North America we have is um, uh, a pit vipers. Mm. So that's cotton mouse, rattlesnakes. Um, what are some of the other ones? But yeah. The North Americans are all in the same class. Now it turns out you can. There's anti venom that's made to cover all the class in a North America, yeah. but uh, I have not found a doctor friendly enough to actually get me a prescription so I could actually have some. I have found a vet alternative, and I'm working that channel to see if I can get some that way. But snake bites are something I I'm still I still see as a very very 
big problem and a very, very ugly problem that we don't have a good solution for. And a tourniquet and then get out the saw. Yeah. <laughs> Could be. But you can always make your own. For me. Uh, orange juice works great for adding to the marinade to soften the burnt meat. Yeah. Well, what were you going to say, Anthony? Make your own anti-venom? Yeah, make your own anti-venom. The, the way it's made is they just basically milk a snake and run it through a pig. Well, so. yeah. Well, pig or horse equine. That. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the other option, <laughs> though, is you could get, like, the rattlesnakes in the area or something like that, milk them, and then slowly build up by injecting small parts of it into everyone, build up a huge antibody tolerance. But you risk anaphylaxis and a bunch of other conditions. I mean, How many people you can't take in the process? I mean, could you give yourself like a like a little tiny dot of like the stuff every day until you were like immune somehow? Yeah, that's effectively it. You're slowly building up a tolerance to it. Like um, the milkmaids during smallpox in the 1700s. Mm. Yep. Yep. And, they, and they, the other they, one is uh, actually not to hijack us too far, but something else that um, on our terms of long term preparedness, uh, I was reading about tuberculosis recently. Um, I had no idea that TB to even the stuff that's not drug resistant usually required a six to nine months dose of antibiotics. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. That significantly affects my plans because uh, that would drain out most of my stores of medicines to treat a single person. Don't get uh, TB. Absolutely. Right. <laughs> yeah. But it was very common in the past. Very, very common. Well, oh, don't yeah, forget. Definitely. Anyways, back to food, food storage. <laughs> don't worry about, or don't yeah, forget about what happens to your gut okay. on uh, antibiotic use. You're gonna, your gut bacteria is gonna get taken out as well, and you're gonna be real sick if you don't take care of that. So, make sure you're constantly worried about or thinking about fermenting foods. You know, kind of bringing it back to food storage. If you can learn how to ferment and kind of build that natural, uh, you know, brine to to make yeah. the good bacteria work for you. It'll help you in the long run, too. Actually, that's a great point, Anthony, is I found out from myself personally is, like, I don't digest certain types of food very well at all. But and yeah. but all our food today is so sanitized and everything. I found when I ate stuff with real live cultures, real fermented food, you know, real um, what's it, sauerkraut, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of, like, the vegetables and all that that I have trouble eating, if you eat some of the sauerkraut and stuff like that with it, Suddenly, you know, they can take care of it for me, like doses me with the bacteria I need to help keep it going. Well, you I, can make your own yogurt really easily yeah, that way. Just get a heating pad and milk I and then yogurt put a little bit of yogurt every day in that milk, and it'll keep on making more yogurt. So you can just keep yes. an indefinite supply of yogurt if you yeah, just but there's keep a, a heating pad. There's different types of bacteria that happily ferment different other things. So yep. it's, it seems like really important the part we've kind of missed in some of our uh, food setups is we need these different fermented live growth bacteria, live systems that we consume to keep our gut bacteria in good health. And that will help, you know, digest and process a lot of our foods for us that we're not directly used to. Uh, we've moved really far away from some of the old natural ways of handling things. I think that's why so many people right now are getting into drinking kombucha and stuff. Probably yeah. is. Probably is. A lot of um, stomach problems. I'm yeah. going to start doing a... a getting into fermenting a lot of stuff directly um, and making videos about it. And I'm certain everyone's going to laugh at a bunch of my failures because before you start getting it right, you have some colossal failures in the mix. <laughs> well, get get a good quality crock. I learned that one from previous mistakes. I didn't get a good crock and a weight on top, and I kept having uh -huh. to skim off a lot of the, of the bad bacteria off the top. It's really not that hard if you just make a good saltwater brine and put uh -huh. some, like, cabbage and stuff down and just fermenting cabbage – but it yeah. can't touch above that mark. And that's what I learned the hard way. I didn't put a good enough weight down on top of it. So by not putting the weight down, I kept having to keep scooping off a lot that kept touching air because it would go bad. So oh, okay. if you can make sure that whatever weight you put on your, you know, in your stuff, because it's going to give off gas and it's yeah. going to want to push off whatever <laughs> you're put on top. So a good rock or something, the, the right size needs to, to keep whatever you're trying to ferment under that brine solution. So at least ferment for the, two weeks you do it just keep don't forget that part because i made that mistake okay that that's a good tip mm. yeah i'm i'm just getting started looking at how to do that so um yeah, i'll have I, to make videos showing the mistakes though so people can laugh <laughs> well that's how people learn that's how i learn you're good at that reed 
Yeah, I've the, never tried to do that. <laughs> well, it's like the it's actually a lot of channels that only show the successes kind of bug me because it's like, yeah. well, I know you had issues along the way. They're really helpful to let other people see. Well, don't do this. <laughs> You know, that well, often you know, saves a lot of trouble. If I yogurt, I'm probably going to poison everybody in this house. So <laughs> I'll show that. It's, yogurt yogurt is really, really, I really easy. Just, yeah. I have yogurt constantly going on the counter all day, every it's day. It's so easy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like making a starter I for sourdough. I have, I have a yogurt every day. It, it's healthy for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Kind of cleans out your innards. Acidophilus. Acidophilus. Yeah, like, I don't know how to pronounce you can it. go back you can go back and rewatch one of uh modern refugees videos where he's making bread and he had a sourdough starter that's basically the same thing you just keep it's a sourdough and you're using yeah. yeast to your advantage you're using that to help you without having to worry about using yeast because he's got caught wild yeast he's basically fermenting that flour solution and also mm -hmm. i can't read the chat but i wonder is uncle al talking about like the vietnamese rice yet the fermented rice Oh, kimchi or kami or well, how do you, you say know, that again? The uh, the Vietnamese did a really good thing where they would ferment white rice no. and it would give you a whole bunch of extra stuff so you could yes. digest it all, and uh, it was a lot better for your body when you fermented like that. I'm gonna have uh, to research that one for sure. Because there's one is like I've had that before. It's little really balls. good. Well, it's like the and other one I'm also real interested in is um, you know, fermented soybeans. To make like soy sauce and some of the other stuff, because yeah. mm -hmm. that stuff's really beneficial. Um, sticky, and sticky. Uh, what do you call sticky uh, rotten soybean? Yeah, not to, not to, or something is, like that. Yes, that stuff is good. And then natto, there's um, natto. yeah, natto. And what's the one of the other ones out there that's uh, real interesting Tempe. to me? Tempe. Mm. That that's one of them. Yeah, because all that stuff is really really helpful. I'd also like to learn how to make tofu i know that sounds crazy but it's a good protein source and i'd really like to figure out how to get tofu, it to work but it's such an awful process I don't how, want to do it. how many people know how to uh put cheese on your uh long-term list cheese <coughs> cheese yep i've seen it done but i haven't tried it yet um hard just to it in wax. cheese is hard to it's keep but cheese. it can be kept yeah, oh, definitely. Well, hard cheeses can be kept better than soft cheeses. Soft cheeses. Yeah, yeah. there's a block. The best way to keep those is to encase wax. them in wax. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, stuff. and some uh, cheese actually works better with the mold on the outside. Like, you leave it and let it crust over and mold, and then you eat the inside. Well, that well, would actually, be better for you to be able to do your antibiotic stuff, too. You could use some of that mold to play around with. The, like the, the, the right what's, the, what's the mold that grows on the outside of the 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 like the salamis? Is that the same mold? No, I don't think so. Okay, I don't, I don't all know. Foods all foods are different strains of mold. I know that with certain cheeses, a hard cheese, <laughs> you want the blue. It's like the blue mold for like you know your blue cheeses. But I know you with yeah. some cheeses you can leave them out and buy them with the mold on there, and you just eat the inside, and that mold acts like the <laughs> wax. Using wax to try yeah. to do what the mold did. So. But cheeses like brie and camembert that have like a white crust on the outside, but they're soft in the inside. The white crust on the outside is also mold. Mm -hmm. But you can eat it. Well, well lots like of mold is actually, you know, I mean, some of the most important antibiotics were for mold. It's uh, only like um, like mycotoxins that you can't eat, and those are the molds uh, byproducts that cause cancer. Now, actually, since we're on this stuff, okay, so who's an expert on botulism? I know enough to get me to know. Yeah, me too. I mean, they usually, like, uh, it usually happens in, like, uh, acidic foods that are canned. It's, well, like botulism, it, it exists everywhere. It just, it, it depends on how fast it's going to grow. And in acidic mm -hmm. foods, it doesn't grow near as fast as the non-acidic foods. And that's we why have, if you pressure can. We so. have an expert out in the side chat, probably. Okay, I'll step out and they can... Probably be hoopals. He'd be able to tell us about botulism. In cans, just don't eat anything bulgy. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, that, that's true. The only, the only, believe it or not, I'm keeping an eye on it. There's a product coming out that is a botulism test strip. So you yeah. can test your canned food. It's not released yet. They are still testing it. 
But as soon as they get those, I plan to stock up on those things. Oh, God, I want one so bad because I have old, old, old MREs and cans, and I want to check them. <laughs> yeah. Know? Now, yeah, usually, I'm though, yeah, but Not like yet. like you said earlier, Alana, though, anything that's bulged, uh, yeah, you don't want to know. The problem is, is like when it's just starting, so it's like putting things under pressure, but it hasn't bulged the can yet. Right. Those that's things you could open. And they could have, you know, botulism toxin. So when you open the can, one of the things I've been told, I'm not an expert on this one, is you need to listen to see if, like, you feel there's outgassing of the can. Mm -hmm. And that can tell you if something like that. And you also need to look at the condition of it, like, if there's any signs of gassing Bubbles. or anything. Right. Yeah. Bubbles in your food is bad. If the can was bulging, it would be out of there. I'd be seeing it, using it for target practice and stuff. <laughs> Bulges and smell. You always want to trust your sense of smell. And when it comes to botulism, I, I want to try one of those. It's on some of the rich people downtown. Yeah, me too. <laughs> botulism doesn't have an odor. Yeah. Well, then there's crazy yeah. stuff like that fermented food Swedish spoiled. food out of uh, Sweden, that Sir Strumming or whatever, that crazy fermented Sir mess. Sir Strumming, yeah. That, the, the that is that edible, but... Your, yeah. Canned rotten fish. Yeah. How about like, how about canned cheese? Did anybody try it, uh, storing canned cheese? Yeah. Oh I yeah, actually, I have a that cheese. yeah that Bega canned cheese. That's uh -huh. pretty good. Uh, it's really salty though. You need to. Oh yeah. You, you need to watch out. It's salty as heck. Now there is actually one of the universities has a canned cheese you can buy from them. Yes. And it's to a. a uh, cool, like you could put it in a root cellar or something like that. It'll keep indefinitely. Um, I will have to find the name of the university again and ma make a video about it eventually. I was going to order some. Cougar cheese. Yeah, yeah you'll see them yeah, up there it. on the screen there. Uh, Washington State University. Anthony, Cougar about botulism. If you got your uh, phone open. Yeah, no, I got you. I just... Uh... It's when it comes to bottles, can't kill it with boiling. So that's why when they pressure can, you got it because it got it has to have 240 degrees to kill it. Yeah. And boiling only goes to 220. Right. So you boil all, can. Hoople said boil all expired foods for five well, minutes while the, stirring. What I remember is that the botulism spores can go over 200 degrees and stuff like that. So that's why you got to go to 240 or the higher right, temperature yeah, pressure yeah, canning. Can but the it. botulism toxin itself is not stable over like 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. And it comes apart when boiled. I'm gonna look gotcha. It says that you use taste, color, smell, and texture. It, and it has toxin in it, then you die. <laughs> and the problem is it only takes a micro amount of botulism yeah. toxin to just kill you. Um, Wreck you. Yeah, and the yeah, only way to treat a botulism poisoning is with some medications that are very hard to get. Um, uh, atropine is one of them because you're dealing with a neurotoxin mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, when in doubt, throw it out. I don't. I just. I don't play around with botulism. That's why I pressure can uh, if I can first. That way I can avoid that situation. Obviously, pressure canning isn't in the realm of possibility for everybody, but you know. That'll stop well, it. You, you have to use pressure canning for any low acid system. There's just no guarantee. I mean, even if you have something like salsa with tomatoes in it, I prefer to to pressure can just so there I know I can put it a bit longer. There, he's got a link for you. Thanks, Hoopals. All right, I got this cheese link for you, too. It'll be up on the screen there in a second. This year, I'll definitely Actually, come back and check. Out to, uh, I want to know more about botulism myself. Watch kids. Uh, oh, it in trouble. It'll be a Thursday. The lag gets out of the way. Yeah, and yeah. So botulism is that's why you want to have it. You pressure can it. Cheese. Everything else, and then if there's any sign your sale has a problem with it, just don't use it. Yeah, the risk don't is just store too those high. cans with pop tabs make sure you store cans will actually require a can opener i know a lot of cans are going with those little pull tab pull ring tabs don't use those cans don't don't store those a long time just for anyone in the side chat that, who might be getting into this kind of for the first time those cans do not store well and any kind of pressure will pop that period so, yeah that's a, that is actually exactly if true. you do that you need to watch those tops if they start springing on you get rid of it yeah the other problem with those darn uh 
It's, and the other thing, though, is it seems like it's the convenience of society. It's getting hard to find stuff without those stupid pull tops. That's what I'm saying. I'm really like, getting annoyed with that. Rotate them more often. Yeah. It's, don't they don't want you to have well. stuff. It's just, I mean, I get everybody doesn't have a can opener. It's, it's easy for convenience, but it's just like buying pre-cut food. It's like, great, now my food's not going to last as long because you cut it already. Pre-sliced mm -hmm. bread. Look how convenient this butternut squash is. I cut it for you. Well, butternut squash will keep for like four months, five months if you don't cut it. Thanks for cutting it. Yeah, I've got a spaghetti squ squash that's pretty old, and it's still okay. <laughs> yeah, I have sort of spaghetti squash, squash in like my pantry months. from five months ago that's still okay. They call them winter squash for a reason. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, they're Are telling powdered the eggs can last up to seven years, so that should be uh, considered a long-term food that's item. Oh, have, there's uh, some really neat brands of uh, eggs. I should do a video on it. I actually have some expired powdered eggs. And while, what happened to them is the color got a little off. They're mm. still edible. And I found using them for okay. baking works just fine. Oh, yeah. But I'm not going to make an omelet out of them because it just looks kind of odd. <laughs> a green eggs? Eating a green egg. And green well, they're not green. Egg. They're like a really pumpkin orange. <laughs> oh. Well. I, I eat too many powdered eggs in the military no one never I again mean, that's why i brought that up anthony because i knew that you were ex-military never ever ever again <laughs> i mean they I like they eggs. made them all the time on my ship out of powdered uh, uh, every egg, egg. scramble them up oh you don't know what you're eating you know that's what they yeah. used to tell us you know you don't really know if they're real or not just eat them those darn powdered eggs and cottage cheese on the boats. That's all I lived off of because I <laughs> needed protein. Let's go into legumes and lentils. Those are pretty good ones there. You need to have those uh, on your long term. Don't forget peas. Peas can store the same with those. Peas are in that same category, yes. Because dry storage is my number one way of doing it. But you don't have to. You can pressure can as well. You can pressure can them, and they're saying you can also dehydrate them. And I'm sure they're talking about uh, the dry dehydrating, like we talked about earlier, where you just put them in a, a jar and pull the air out of them. Bags of peas. That's 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 probably one of the best ways to do it. That's what I do with a lot of mine. I put them in a jar and just dry dry store them. Said so if you put them in a in mylar and put an oxygen absorber in with them, they'll last yeah. up to 25 years. If they get moldy, don't eat them. <laughs> I believe. <it. laughs> Rule of thumb, don't eat but, moldy uh, food. Well, I made some, like, uh, you know, the packs with the silica beads in. Just I just sewed stuff over it and made my own because I wanted them to be larger. I know you can refresh those by putting them in the oven and drying them out, but that's all I've ever done with those. I've only like bought silica beads and just, like, get material and just slice that's it. For, not for oxygen. But you have to double stitch it. And we're going to get next into uh, Alana's uh, hmm? line of work is MREs or meals ready to eat. Those last, uh, let me see. Now that Lori Jean has disappeared again. Well, <laughs> they say five to ten years, but. I would, I'm think, so, I'm, I would think that they would last a they whole lot longer than longer. five or ten years. Oh, yeah. Some of how long, long, how long do the ones that you do, Alana? Oh, well, I mean, you know, the other people that review them, some people have, like, had some from the 80s that are still perfectly edible. Well, then there's that guy, uh, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hasn't he Steve done something that's, like, from the 50s? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's somebody you know, out there that does... You know, he eats like stuff. I mean, he's gotten botulism. Really? Yes. I think Lori Jean popped people. out, but I was thinking that she would have something to input on that too. Yeah, yeah Steve is way, so. way too, uh, too adventuresome. <laughs> yeah, he shouldn't be doing that. No, no, no. Not the average person should not be doing what Steve is doing. I know Kaylin did one today. She did one today that was expired, but it was only like, uh, I have to a year. Now yeah, I have. So I mean, if you if you have them and they're like five six years out of date, they're gonna be okay. If you start getting into like you know thirty years, twenty years, they're gonna start getting messed up. And 
you don't want to take chances in a situation like that. Where would yeah, you get, where would you get a thirty year MRE that's already been stored that long? eBay. <laughs> buy them eBay. online. <laughs> that's where people are getting them. They're buying them online. They're all over the place. Well, you got to watch out with that kind of stuff yeah, because yeah. I know being in the military myself, what they do is they take the the MREs and they put them like say on the aircraft, and they'll mm -hmm. sit in a hot aircraft for like an entire deployment. So in yes. Afghanistan, they'll be on the aircraft for 10 months in 130 degrees. Mm -hmm. And then when they bring them back and no one eats them, they were, they just turn them back in. And then those yeah. ones that have been turned back in that have been sitting in the heat end up getting sold on the civilian market. And you're thinking that you're good for five, six, seven years when mm -hmm. all the heat just completely ruined your storage. So you got to know oh, when, exactly. when you're getting they're the at 30, MREs. Yeah, the way it's yeah. stored. The they're at 30,000 feet being going both ways too, you know. Well, it's like the, the dried ones are probably the, the longest stored. Yeah. Ones. Like and I have some dried ones, they'll last for indefinitely pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I have some MREs that are pretty old myself um, that we're still going through. And like the only thing I found that's like really expired on the ones, because I got some that are about 10 years old now, is like yeah. the cheese sauce yeah. isn't any good um, and stuff like no. that. But pretty much everything this else is, is fine. The main um, meals no, the are usually good. Nuts won't be okay if you have anything like a nut bar or, or like a chocolate nut cookie or something. The nuts will be rancid. So the nuts will always be rancid after that long, and the cheese will always have separated into some weird oily mass. Yeah. The, the peanut butter will last for a very, very, very long time. The, yeah, that's the what's crazy will. about the peanut butter is it always seems to be fine, even in those little packets. It's always fine. Even the one from the 50s was fine. But I know. All that oil in there. <laughs> I don't know how the peanut butter is. I don't know what like, they're doing to those peanut butter things when they make them. making them but, immortal. <laughs> yeah, and Vampire it's crazy. Peanuts. Like, you'll see, like, Steve or some of those other people eat it, and it's like, oh, yeah, the peanut butter was just fine, and, you know, it's 90 years right. old, and you're like, what the heck? <laughs> it doesn't even look like peanut butter anymore. It's, like, got that weird cream color to it. It's like, mm -hmm. It got lighter. The yeah. apple jelly seems to last indefinitely, too. It just yeah, that darker. apple jelly. It gets yeah. darker and darker and darker, but it's still edible. <laughs> the, but, yeah, the I mean, that's why when I try to buy MREs, I'll buy, like, the for myself, I like to buy the the ones, you know, fresh from the manufacturer, so the civilian version. Yes. Or if I can get my hands on the, – there's a couple places that sell contract overruns for the military ones, and so yeah. I like to buy those. Uh, I learned my experience buying uh, eBay ones or online ones no, a couple I, times. No, you don't Oof. know how they were stored if you do that. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. That's the main thing. That is the exact that problem. They stored in a freezer for 15 years, but they could lie. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I go it's, to, like, um, yeah. like um, MRE Mountain or, or like, that's MRE a good Nation. store. MRE Nation or all MREs, they have them newer. Yeah, they do. I also like that you can buy, like, um, the menus you particularly like yes. out of them. Um, cause like there's, case. yeah, yeah, exactly. Cause you can get, you can get a whole bunch of the ones you really enjoy. Um, or that suits your dietary plan a lot better too, you know? Well, like and the so. MRE channel people that do the reviews did a meetup last month of like about a month ago where they all went down to Kentucky. Oh, neat. In Kentucky, there is the MRE nation, um, place where they package the MREs. Oh, interesting. So they let everybody go through the whole place and look at all the components and everything. It was kind of cool, and I wasn't able to go, but a lot of people did go. Steve was there. A lot of people were there, and they were showing where they were made, and these are like the new ones where they're just making them now. Uh-huh. So they're all fresh, and they haven't been stored for a long time. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Have you tried that pizza one yet? With all those MREs when they bring I all haven't. the pizza on from all the wars. I want the sausage pizza one, which is the one that doesn't have meat. Oh, okay. Sausage <laughs> is TVP. <laughs> oh, okay. But the, but the pepperoni one is real neat. Oh, that, okay. That makes that sense. One. You can buy that one there, actually. Single yeah, I've flight. seen it for sale. I just haven't I haven't bought it. Um, I haven't bought any new real MREs uh, because I haven't finished eating the old ones, and I don't want oh. new ones until I've done with my old ones. Um, I don't so eat them you're often. you rotating your MREs. <laughs> yeah, I, I rotate. I try to rotate as much as I can. I was like... There's no point in buying and spending the money if you don't rotate it and you just let it all go bad. Right. And some stuff I've gotten, um, we've gotten a little too far on the date. And I'm like, man, I got to get this done soon. So, you know, sometimes it's like, well, we're going to do MREs for every lunch this week. <laughs> well, I guess it's better than wasting food. But MREs are not really meant to eat 
like for months and months and months and months as your sole food source. Yeah, but, not, oh no. You ever been in the military? Stomach, that's what the you do. Constipation. You know, it's really supposed to be just short term emergency food until you can get back to like a mess kitchen or something. You know. Well, yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. But Anthony can <laughs> but tell you they don't exactly follow the rules, do they, Anthony? <laughs> No, I've had saying, MRE. I'm just saying, like, yeah, it ends up that these guys are eating them for months and they're having problems. And it's the same thing with like end of the world or whatever. You know, you don't want to eat MREs as your sole source of food too long. If well, you store MREs yeah. as your sole source of food, you definitely need to be storing some fiber because you will be hating yourself yes. when you're sitting there waiting to try Rack to get rid of whatever because yeah. then MREs will stop you up. Yep, get yeah, some laxative in there. And they don't have enough stuff. They have a lot of preservative. And a lot of sodium. Actually, uh, so you guys may MREs have never had. I've never had any problem getting stopped up with an MRE, but I have a weird digestive system. Well, I haven't either, <laughs> but I haven't eaten them solely for months either. Yeah, eat them yeah. for like three months in a row, and you're gonna hate your whole I mean, life. I eat them for a couple of weeks. Anybody could, but you can't eat them for like half a year and expect to be okay. Actually, because this brings up a, a really good point we should fiber. talk about. Is one of the things that's really vital to maintaining good morale. So like a disaster for develops and all that stuff and all that is you mm. don't want to have a food shock. So the foods you store, the food you have yeah. kept, the food in your pantry really should be what you like to eat, what's yeah. normal, what is an mm, average start a part of your dietary things. Because if you have a if you two things is one, if you have a major shift into food that hey you don't really like that much, that's going to depress your morale and make getting stuff done hard. The yeah. second, when you have a big shift in the food and what you're eating. Um, Sometimes you can either go one of two ways, you know, have horrific case of the runs or yeah. you are horrifically constipated yep. and that either side is not good. So making certain you don't have a dietary shock when a disaster strikes is really mm -hmm. important. Exactly. No, it is. You got to store what your diet store is. Store what you eat. Yep. I'm not going to store like all meat. And then the second something happens, I'm suddenly eating all meat after I haven't for years and make myself sick. Yep. I'd have and, to gradually go back into that, you know. <laughs> or, you know, and it's like the, also the other point is, is especially if you have children, um, yeah. I don't have any children, so I don't have experience with this, but I know plenty of parents who their kids are picky eaters. And if you don't have a stockpile of food for the kids that you can slowly transition them to eating other stuff, uh, yeah. you might be dealing with a lot of stress you don't want to deal with. Well, I don't have kids well, either, but I know... I know kids who only eat like PB and J's and pizza mm -hmm. and any, and hot dogs and anything else is icky. And that's going to be a serious problem. One thing I wanted to, to bring up is the, uh, from, from experience, one of my, our biggest morale boosters we had when we were in Afghanistan on them, you know, smaller bases and fobs. One of the best things that made us happy and kind of brought everything was a hot meal. So, Mm -hmm. If you can, I mean, I'm not talking about um, MRE heater. Every, you know, MRE heaters are one thing, but I'm talking about like right. on a plate, like a human being eating a hot meal can bring all the morale in the world. So don't forget about the little things like that little stuff like that after so many weeks really does mean a lot. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. real, real you're still going to want to be eating like a person whenever yeah. you can. Who's, it, who's eating a 30 year old Twinkie? <laughs> yeah, 30 year old Twinkie. That'd be awfully depressing for people who aren't. Nobody's eating, eating a 30 year old Twinkie. No, I've I mean, never done that. Yeah. They have long term shelf life, you guys. So they say, but they have all kinds of like um, <coughs> fat oils in them. Wouldn't they go rancid? They're made in Mexico now. Yeah. They are? It, it was actually, it was saying in the article I read that they keep pretty well as long as you keep them in a cool, dry place. That oh, okay. the, the, the bread part of it might taste a little stale, but overall, they still taste like Twinkies. See, the cream <laughs> in Twinkies, the cream center has beef tallow in it, hmm. which I don't need anyway. But if I did, wouldn't I was assumed that beef tallow would eventually go rancid before the cake would. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't I wouldn't try one, but I tried one well, after like tried a, a year old. I, what didn't taste any worse. It just had like a the bread was like a little crunchy. Right. Now, I don't I don't like Twinkies and stuff. I really don't. For, I've never liked them at all. The. Now, Me actually, freeze-dried ice cream, I like that. I like that oh a lot. Oh, my God, I want a million of those. Somebody send me those a million Those taste absolutely ice great. <laughs> ice no, cream so sandwiches, good, yes. Oh, my God. Our They're so good. Is going out of business, and I went there today looking for those, and they don't even sell them at our Walmart. 
Oh, man. I thought I was going to be able to get a good deal because there's a liquidation sale going on. Yeah. They like that, when, they, when they had it, astronaut ice cream in the 80s, I was like, oh, man, this is great. <laughs> it's not astronaut ice cream. They never ate that in space. I know. They never ate it. But that's what they told, called it was astronaut ice cream. <laughs> yes, they did. Because when I was in high school, we went to the planetarium every week. And they oh, sold okay. the astronaut ice cream at the planetarium. And that's where I discovered that it existed. Yeah. Astronaut it, ice cream. <laughs> yeah. Well, boy, that stuff is so good. Yeah, yeah, a bunch right. of... There was a sale one time, so I bought a bunch of those MRE freeze dried uh, uh, ice cream sandwiches. So I got a whole pile of yeah. them. <laughs> oh, they're awesome! I don't have any left. I ate them all. I was yeah. going to store them, and I ate them all. <laughs> yeah, Neil yeah. They're good. Make sure you guys are storing five gallon buckets of salt and sugar. Making oh, yeah. sure it is. Uh, that is what I'm. Different lacking. kinds of salts. Yeah. Definitely use. There's multiple types of salt. You want to Monster make sure you salt. have enough iodized salt, but you also want to make sure you have enough salt if you're doing some canning because you can't use table salt when you can. Yep. It's got anti canning agents in it, and it'll turn your and stuff it, colors and it'll work. It stores, it, it stores indefinitely, so it'd be yeah. to your advantage to just store as much as you could for at least up to 20 years or so. You know, I, Iodized does have an expiration date, so just keep that part in mind. Now, if you can't... Now, long term, actually, grow plants with a lot of iodine in them. And actually, lima beans is a good example. It has a lot of iodine in it. So, growing lima beans is a good plant to do. Um, there's several others that have a, a lot of iodine you can get your source from. Um, seaweed. It's not like all of us are going to have a good source of iodine near us that we can go mine our salt with, you know? Well, the, just saying the iodized, I mean, I did a whole video on salt. The iodized salt does not last but, what, 10 years or something? So. Just remember no that. iodine, you got to get kosher salt with no iodine in it also because the iodized stuff will spoil. Yeah, so yeah the like iodine, usually, it's, it's iodized. So. All right, oh, it might be solid, but it will not be spoiled. Well, the, the all, yeah, you can't use iodized salt for like your fermentation because the iodine will actually help kill stuff, yeah. Yeah, and it's uh, anti-caking. So if you put it in a lot of stuff, all the anti-caking stuff is going to really – Diminish your. Oh yeah. Like they would make whatever. Yeah, I stole so honey. Make I, I don't even have any sugar. I stole honey. <laughs> I guess I wasn't really thinking about it. Well, yeah, white sugar, sugar is lasts super indefinitely. important, um, for especially for canning purposes. We need sugar yeah. immensely. The mm -hmm. I'm I am I am working on figuring out how to make sugar from sugar baits. Um, I still have a long way to go. <laughs> sugar beets. Yeah, from sugar beets. I finally have got a, a strain of sugar beets that grow go out here go a lot of them and then i've got to make juice and then i've got to make actual crystalline sugar from it so i got a long ways to go sugar tastes better than sugar cane sugar yeah, yeah. i don't have an answer on that one other things we haven't talked about one is is honey honey, honey should be always on the shelf it, yep. it's good for everything not just eating but medicinal as well i would like to get some bees and actually start raising bees but i haven't even gotten to that point yet <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a vegetable apiary but with honey for sure you want to make sure that you grab the unfiltered and you're looking at the back of the label so it's not yes. cut with anything like you're you're you know my wife likes the one with the little bear because she <laughs> likes you know she <laughs> yeah that is thing real honey. Like, and the bear is not real honey most no, of the time so. yeah that's what i was gonna say make sure it's the real thing and not that stuff to store cells the the uh, hydrogenated sugar substitute or whatever yeah. high no, no. corn syrup. Get yeah. the one with the honey. A five in. gallon bucket of pure raw honey. Boy, was that expensive. Yeah. <laughs> because you can use. But the I bet wax it's probably pretty honey. good. It is good. It is. We've got some smaller ones. We've been working on uh, smaller little tiny tote buckets of honey. Of honey yeah. that's pure honey. It's really really good. Um, I do enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Another thing is uh, bouillon. Make sure you got some bouillon in a bucket with a little oxygen absorber in it because you're going to need that just yes. to make you feel better <laughs> when you cook with it. It's going to make you feel make better. And well, powdered, milk, powdered milk is on the list as well. I'm reading off a list I have here. <laughs> well, powdered milk doesn't powdered keep milk. super long, so do keep no. an eye on that date for uh, – uh, uh, what is it? Uh, cycling out because if like I use whole uh, powdered milk, so whole milk, so it has the fat in it. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and I find that tastes better and it's good for cooking stuff yeah. than using that better. The only thing is it has a much shorter love shelf life because of the fat. Well, it has, like, it has like, 20 years, longer, it has like but, a 20 years yeah. shelf life, actually. If I you put oxygen absorbers in there and put on one of those lids that seal, it will last totally up to about 20 years. But it's like you say, you have to rotate it. it won't get well, that's, that's probably the non-fat powdered milk. Yeah, It's the stuff with the fat that you really got to watch for. And stuff. I don't yeah. like canned milk. Now, I did find some freeze-dried milk, actual freeze-dried <laughs> milk. It was horrifically expensive, yes. but I, I, I bought a little tiny packet of it. I'm going to try, but I still haven't messed with it yet. And then there's the basics yogurt. like uh, instant coffee or cocoa powder or tea or something like that. Those are all good shelf life. They have good 10-plus year shelf life on them. So. Mm -hmm. Anthony's got a good video about dark chocolate and why you should store it. Yeah. Yeah, the, them, chocolate great. is good for a lot of different things, not just uh, eating like a You're going to need it. You're going to need dark chocolate if there ever is a situation. Not only just to, I mean, I'm not talking about like bartering and everything, but I mean, just the fact that it's got fiber, it's got fats, everything is super condensed in a small little area so you can store a lot of it and really not have to worry about it. And the fact that dark chocolate doesn't have the milk in it, that milk chocolate does, it's going to last a little longer. So that's... Right. So many reasons why you should definitely That's why they have it. The military stuff, the dark stuff instead of the milk stuff. Yeah. Because it gets all white on the outside, but it's still perfectly edible. Well, we went over tonight, but we covered a lot of stuff, you guys. We could have gone. We could have gone on for a lot longer too, but we covered most of it. One thing I wanted to add, Will, going back to the. Uh, the oatmeal and stuff make sure with the, if you're storing like oatmeal and uh, cornmeal that kind of stuff you freeze it before you store it so the boll weevils don't oh, yeah, get the bugs out of it yes oh um, god yeah i freeze all of my there. before i put them away because otherwise i get same with the oh. rice i didn't bring, even bring up the rice but rice is yeah. just ba a basic of uh, preparing rice yeah, and it, oatmeal especially make sure you freeze it before you store it because them boll weevils will become active and they will ruin half your stuff and i i, I keep wild rice too because it's abundant up here so probably cheaper up there. wild rice because yeah. it's really good for you white rice or brown rice either one is a good staple to keep on hand yeah. Well, the thing about brown rice is you got the hole on it so it's the oils are going to make it go rancid yeah. faster so you have to get the white rice because it's, it's hullest. You get white rice and wild rice. Brown rice doesn't last. As well, Hubble good. says you should eat your weevils. They're good protein. Yeah. I'm not going to want to see him do it. Happen. Tell him to do it and do it online so we know he really did it. Whether we'll see the pro how the process goes. Well, you know what? <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, okay. If we have an Armageddon or something, I'll eat the weevils. But why do I don't want to do that now, Hoople? <laughs> No, we I don't want to eat the weevil the poop. <laughs> I don't mind eating weevils. I don't want to eat the weevil poop because you know they're going to be yeah. eating and pooping in that bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, Anthony. Yep. Just remember, your alcohol is the piss and sweat of the sweat of the east. Uh, you're right. <laughs> well, wild rice is not really rice, Uncle. It's not. It's a. It's like a wild weed. Oh, no, well, I said, don't no brown, no wild. wild or brown rice. And I said, but wild rice is not even actually rice. It's like a grain, like a uh, wheat berry. Yeah, it, yeah, wheat berries, I have those stored too. I love He's saying berries. Milo. Mm -hmm. Wild rice actually lasts for a really long time if you store it right. Anything else from the really side good. chat? I'm looking at the side chat. That's where I found that. Yep. Is there yeah. anything else we need to confront from um, there? I will look. Explain a little better about the coffee. Um, let's That's see. not my wheelhouse. They're Tag talking out. about uh, they're talking about eating weevils and stuff. Well, Hubble says you should eat rabbit poop. What? Rabbit poop. I'll put that in my yes. garden. Eat what the garden makes. How about that? There you go. We're not put it uh, in the garden, and whatever comes up, I'll eat. Rabbit We're poop is the only thing that won't burn your plants. <laughs> oh, you mean nitrogen burn? Yeah, nitrogen burn. Oh, rabbit yeah. poop is right, right away. You don't have to worry about composting it for a while. Rabbit poop can go right in the garden. 
Yeah, my buddy, he, he had rabbits just for that fact. He had like 12 rabbits, and he had the bottom of the pins were all that uh, little square mesh stuff, so the poop just fell right through, and he would just scoop it up and put it out in the garden. Perfect. He had perfect, he had good plants growing. Yeah, I mean, we need to actually set up good septic systems and stuff where we can actually compost all of our waste from us, mm -hmm. the animals, and everything else and reuse it as fertilizer. It's going to be really yep. hard for rebuilding. Yeah, yeah we can get that in another video about the circle of of life, I guess you could say, where, you know, you could use, like, the hydroponic system. We can kind of get into that in another, another, another video. Day, yeah. yeah. All right, yeah. you guys. I'm going to let the side chat go. Don't anybody go anywhere inside the panel we'll talk about next week. Have well, a good night, it. everyone. Hope yep. you liked and got some information out of it. Good night. Alana? Yeah? Tell everybody good night. Oh, good night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Good night, everyone. <laughs> All right. Hold on a second. They're all